Cool. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Docker Swarm, um, but more importantly, just how easy and simple it is to use. If you guys don't know what Docker Swarm is, it's something that Docker released in the 1.12 branch, um, and it's basically built into Docker. Um, I must be honest, I don't know if this is going to be the final thing everyone will use, but what I really like is, and you'll see, it's just the simplicity of how to install it and set it up and how many things it just does for you just straight out of the box. Um, I'm hoping all the other guys, uh, the Kubernetes, uh, Habitat, whatever, steal the, these ideas of how really, really simple it is to set up because th that's the thing. Most of us don't have time to be experts at everything, like networking, um, and you know, the one thing no one wants to solve here is storage and all the rest of things. And if, if the right decisions or the default decisions can be the best for most people, it, we would move forward so much faster. And this is one of the things I think Docker Swarm got quite right. First of all, who here is playing with Docker? Okay, good. How many people are using it in live in production? Okay, <laughs> fewer than I thought. Um, guys, play a bit more with Docker. Um, it, it can make your lives easier. Uh, even the devs out there, I come from a dev background, not, not an ops background. Um, if you're the, the poor dev that knows more about servers, it's going to save you than all the other people in your dev team. It's going to save you a lot of time, especially when, instead of fixing everyone's development environments. Deploy it with Docker. You'll, you'll save yourself days and hours. Um, okay, so my name is Sam Hawk. I'm a Docker captain. I'm not always sure why, but I've been playing with Docker for several years now. Uh, previously, I was at AfriHost. Um, AfriHost, the full front end that you see. There's Docker behind that with HA proxy and Nginx, everything running in that. The whole bunch of invoicing and stuff comes out of Mongo, which isn't Docker, Logstash. Bit by bit, they're moving and migrating quite, quite far into Docker. And the, the more you use it, the more guys on that side are using it, the, the easier certain things become. It's the whole thing about Docker makes it very easy to do things in a repeatable way, um, which is what we all want. You know, the whole thing, um, it doesn't work on live as it does on dev. That goes away, with some caveats, obviously. <clears throat> what I'm going to show you today is just how simple it is to set up a Docker Swarm if you've got Docker already installed. Please ask questions any time. I'd rather ask your questions than finish, answer the questions than finish. Um, also, it, it tends to, you know, if I've gotten something. <clears throat> uh, most of the stuff I'm showing you here, I have a repeat on GitHub, including the talk. Um, so you can go and get anything from there, all the Docker images I'm pulling. Most of the commands I'm going to be typing in. This thing's going to be a very heavy, um, basically I'm just mainly going to be doing a demo for you guys today. Rather than talking and the boring stuff of how it all works and what it's doing, I'm going to be giving a highlight, but I rather want to show you how simple it is to do this stuff. Um, okay, so let's, let's get started. Um, ooh, as I said, I'm going to basically be starting with, there are no servers up right now. Um, if you guys haven't played with Terraform, go check it out. It takes you about an hour or two to actually learn it. It's one of the easiest technologies I've had to learn recently. It was surprisingly simple. But what I'm doing basically now is I'm spinning up five servers onto DigitalOcean. These are just straight Ubuntu 16.04 servers. It's going to create a private network and a public IP network as well. Um, while we're busy waiting for these things to come up, I'm just going to uh, paste some commands. Uh, let's actually wait a bit more. I'll just continue with the talk. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's busy spinning up some servers. I'm then going to just, just now just paste some things to give me some aliases and shortcuts so I don't have to remember what so all the commands I can paste in. Uh, I don't have to remember the IP is 192, whatever, whatever. It's just shortcuts. So when you see me pasting in the commands with that, um, that that's the main reason. Um, I'm just worrying we're doing this over 3G, if anybody's wa wondering. Um, okay, so that's just been a five service into DigitalOcean. It's added DNS entries for me into the DNS server. Um, it's given me, you can see all the public and private IPs it's given me. Uh, by, by the way, all those DNS things are actually working right now. Um, so if I happen to ping uh, do, uh, let's just hope the DNS has updated. Cool. There you see it's re-added it for me with those, those IP addresses it has just created. Um, Terraform can do this against Azure, pretty much all the guys there. Um, I've got one because I'm doing a lot with Azure right now, with does Azure, uh, including all the private networking, spinning up storage, setting everything up. 
If I was going to be doing this in real life, um, I would not be spinning just a space Ubuntu. I'd be using Pack or something like that. So I'm sure you guys have checked that out. Um, basically, you come up with a server that's already pre-configured with everything you want. Um, I'll be mentioning where I'm not quite following exactly how you'd be doing in real life every now and again, just because I don't want people to take this and, and try do it this way because there are some bad practices I'm having. Okay, so what this is just doing is it's just creating some aliases and stuff for me quickly. Uh, because I've got five servers, I've just got five of these terminals up, just so I can show you things when we connect. Um, if you guys are not using Docker Machine, you should check it out. It makes some of the development quite a bit easier, especially when you want to connect and speak to your remote servers. Uh, it will do a key exchange when you set it up. After that, you can just basically on your local PC go uh, Docker machine, basically connect to this environment. After that, it does uh, its SSL bidirectional key communication. So it's fully secure, but you can run all the commands locally. So also, let's say when you log into your uh, repositories, that login is local, it never gets shared on the server. So if anybody does get in there, they don't get your logins for your repositories. It does a lot of very cool things for you. All right, so let's just get my where I am. All right, so what that's done is we've got the full service. Now I'm just gonna basically do a default install of Docker. Uh, let's do this quickly. Okay, so that's basically doing a background command. Um, it's basically doing, uh, with Docker Machine you can do a basically a Docker install against any server out there. You can also get it to spin up your servers. I personally just prefer spinning up the servers myself because then I have, I'm a bit of a control freak. I like knowing exactly what's on it and what it's doing. Um, if you're not into setting up servers yourself, I would just use a, you know, get them to set it up on digital ocean or zero, whatever you prefer. Um, but I like having then access to install whatever else I want on it. Uh, let's just see how it's going. So uh, DM is an alias for Docker machine. Okay, that's still busy going. Um, okay, what I'm going to be doing next is I'm going to show you how you initialize a swarm. Um, it's very complicated. I'm going to be running that command. <clears throat> then you have a swarm. Obviously, it's a swarm with one node. I'm going, then going to be showing you how to add other nodes to it. Um, it's also very horribly complicated. You grab your tokens, and you run whichever mode you want it to be on, on the other servers, and you're pretty much going to be done. You know, So that's a whole swarm, effectively a clustered system. In You'll, you'll see in a couple seconds, actually. Let's just see how this thing's going. So this is just the one thing when, you, when you're doing it live. Installs and servers take a bit of time. Uh, let's go continue just so, okay. Well, that is going to be it once, once we're there. Um, but if you time this, as I said, I've managed to get this into about five to seven, it's been five and 10 minutes, let's call it that, from no servers to a complete swarm up and running. Um, it's, I don't know if anybody else can do that with any other cluster technology out there as quickly, as in from no service to anything. If anybody's trying to do anything clustered, uh, you'll realize how scarily simple that is. Um, yeah, I'm just waiting for the stuff and then we'll continue, otherwise people are going to Okay, all right, it's running. Almost. Okay, so let's just not reboot it. Okay, so I'm just going to, so what these are, these are just aliases that do the doc environment variable that I spoke about. Um, mm. Yeah, no, they're not quite up yet. It's the usual thing when you actually do the demo, it takes longer than you did when you tested it a couple of hours ago. Uh, oh, easier. Let me just see what's going on on the server. Ah, uh, no, not that one. Sorry, this is one of the aliases that I add just to do uh, Docker PS. <laughs> oh, D, zero, zero. So just maybe it's. Uh, 
Why is not this installed? Okay, no, some, something just went there. Okay, let's go to this one here. RD002. Let's show you guys. Okay, that one's running. Okay, um, basically this is just uh, ZSHL, so if you see it in red, that's basically that I'm connected to that server. Just otherwise you get confused and you start running commands against the wrong, wrong server, and you can, if you're not paying attention, you can do a lot of damage. Those are still coming up. All right, so what I'm going to do if these don't come up, why are none of these things? Okay, they're all still running. All right, I'm going to just bring it up on the one that is up for now. I can do some of the demo stuff with that while we're just waiting. It just seems to be a bit slow at the moment. All right, let me just change this one. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm basically initializing the swarm. Um, this thing's going to basically start a CA locally. It's going to generate a whole bunch of certs for itself. It's going to return a whole bunch of tokens that you can use on, um, it, by default it just returns the token for, to create other workers. Um, but if you want to get the other tokens, you can do that quite easily by just, running these commands. Um, you need the tokens to add, add the other servers. So let's just get those out quickly. Okay. Um, now, while I'm waiting for that stuff to go, I'm just gonna talk about, basically, all the, uh, you get, you've got two, you've got workers and masters. One of the big differences between this and most other clustering technologies, the masters can also run services. So when a service runs, if you haven't put a filter on it to exclude masters, it will run on any of the servers. Um, the big difference between the masters, commands can only be run against masters. Workers have no way of changing anything on, on the cluster. Um, the masters speak together with the raft consensus. They basically took the raft consensus, etc. D, uh, console D, or run it. They basically just stripped out the raft D thing from etc. D. They run it in memory, um, so it's a lot lighter and a lot faster. Um, basically, if you're running it with etc. D and stuff, there's a whole bunch of other DB stuff. You have to have uh, restful interfaces for the guys. So they took all that stuff out just to increase the speed of it. Um, all the networking, the communication, what must be run actually occurs in that. Um, obviously, you're being raft, there's got consensus algorithms. Um, if the, the primary master does go down and there are three other, you know, they'll, they'll vote between themselves to bring one of the others up. If you only have one master and disappears, obviously, your, your system is down. Obviously, things running on the workers will keep on running. With all these things, generally you want between three and seven masters. Uh, I know with the raft thing, if you go above seven, uh, the amount of communication between them actually gets too hard and it slows down quite considerably. But if you read through the console D or the etc. D docs, they cover most of this stuff. If you really wanted to, you could make them all masters, uh, or I'm only doing five, um, but it's generally not. Why? Okay, let me just continue with the demo as it is. Right, so this is not gonna be that much fun, um, but basically if you run node list, it will give you all the things that belong to the cluster. At the moment there's only one, and it's it's the leader. Let me see what's going on here. Sorry, all D zero. Let me actually just stop these. And we'll try and do this again. 
the usual thing, you test it so many times and then when it's live, nothing works. Okay, let's do that one. I think somewhere along the way the network dropped or something. Okay. So this is looking more promising. Okay, we're going to lose. Yeah. Okay. DM Alice. Let me just continue with the thing. I'll give it a bit of time. Okay, once it's up, that, that is what you would actually get back. Um, basically, you've got a leader, and um, you'll see I'll create a, a secondary master, which makes it reachable. Um, between the masters, they'll always vote, and they'll, they'll pick one of them as, as leader. Um, if one goes down, you always want consensus. Sometimes if you've got two, it can get a bit wonky. Uh, that's generally why if, if you're running larger clusters, you, want, you must really want five. Um, it's that whole thing is they need a majority to vote between them. Um, if you try and run this command on anything that's not a master, it will not give you anything. And it's, that's the whole part of the security thing, is, is the masters of the people who decide what's going on. The, the, the workers actually know nothing about the cluster. They just get told what to do by the masters. Um, okay, what is sort of happening, it's basically creating a uh, CA route. Um, it's basically then, uh, when they join, it does a key exchange between them. After that, all communication between any node is encrypted. It's done for you out of the box. I, I don't know if anybody's trying to do this quickly. Um, this is hard. Um, on top of that, they're doing a key rotation every 60 seconds. Uh, sorry, every 60, seconds, every 60 minutes, which is the thing we, we all should be doing it. I don't know anyone that actually does that. Um, this is the node and certificate renewals. Um, it's basically, it's, it's, that's, that's a high level overview of what they've done for you. Um, this comes back into the small RAF consensus algorithm and what it's doing. Basically, as I said, you've got your workers sitting there um, with the masters actually, and it's a distributed storage across the masters. Each of them has a complete copy of the whole database, if you want to call it that, all sitting in memory. Uh, I know some people worry about it only being memory, but this is the thing, if the master's off, um, basically all the stuff that it's doing is gone anyway. When it comes back, uh, that's why you want the three or more. It will rejoin and relearn what's going on. Um, it's, as I said, strongly consistent. It, it should, because of the size, become consistent very quickly. Very simple to operate. You, it's so simple, you're actually not doing anything. It's all being done for you um, in memory, and it's secure. Um, and this is basically, um, it also does a routing mesh, which we were talking about a bit more just now. Um, and this is the whole thing, is that when you start and, and you expose a port on the Docker Swarm cluster, so you expose port 80, if you hit any of the servers in the cluster, that port 80, Will, will redirect you to that service. So you do lose the thing that you can have multiple services running on port 80, but generally once you start hitting clustering stuff, uh, that's not quite what you want to do. You'll have a, a load balance of some kind that will redirect either on URL or uh, you know, the site name through to the right service cluster. Um, it also does virtualized networking for you, um, which we'll talk about just now. Uh, basically, it will create a virtual network that will span across your cluster for you. Um, and there's a single command. Also, if you're worried like this, um, I have it running across the, a private network, so it's secure. But if you're on a public network, you can add a command when you create the network, and it will then encrypt that network for you. So you can run secure information without having to worry about it. It's just done all the wiring for you. Um, if you get further and you guys are getting way more advanced, um, I know the guys have spoken about, they've written the stuff that it can plug into the Cisco's and you know, your bigger networking stuff, and that virtualized networking that they create for you, they will do it on those. Um, I haven't done that personally, but I know, I know that's built into this. Um, and basically it is, you, you can start, create a network, and then you can add your services or running containers onto the network. 
Um, and then they basically have a private network when they talk together. Anybody here had done a link to a database and then has to restart the database and then you have to restart everything that's linked to the database? This, it's gone. You don't need to worry about it. Um, basically, when you add a service onto this network, it puts a DNS entry. So only things on that network have that DNS entry. Um, let's say you've called Postgres and your uh, web service will then just speak to the Postgres DNS entry. If you bring it down and up and it comes at a different IP, the DNS will change. Um, it also does a load balanced IP, so uh, you can have it that it will always, I'll, I'll show you that a bit later as well. Okay, let's see if I can actually show you any of this stuff. I'm just going to, anybody who wants me to show, I can show this after this in one of the open things. I'm just going to continue with the talk. Um, okay, so more demo. Um, basically, this is how you create an overlay network. As you can see, once again, incredibly hard. Um, literally, that's it. You've got an overlay network. Um, that's a private network. It's not exposed uh, externally. Um, you can bridge two networks with Docker containers. So you can create two ones. So let's say you've got one network where, for some reason, you've got your databases all together, and then you want to attach you want to have your uh, web servers on a separate network. You can then also have one container that will bridge those two if you want to. Um, I know guys, when they run VPNs, do that sometimes. They'll run Tinked or something like that on the one and bridge it out that way. Um, oh, that's the one thing with the cluster. It is don't run it multi-region. Uh, it's not really designed for that. Rather have multiple ones, one in each region. And it's just got to do with that raft consensus. You want it as fast as possible. And then you'll use something like a, a VPN or something between the regions to speak to them. Um, there's the secure command that I said. Uh, after that, you basically, all, all communication across those networks, across the different servers is encrypted. Um, why you might want to do that is it adds overhead. Like everything, it's basically an encapsulated packet on your network. Um, for most people in South Africa, I think we're not worrying about losing that amount of bandwidth. Uh, but overseas, or if you're doing very high speed something, you might not want to do that. Um, obviously, if you guys are using any of the cloud providers, they've got like virtual networks in the back end, so you don't need to do that. Um, anything attached to that network can speak to anything else attached to that network. It does DNS entries. I'm going to show you the two DNS entries that it gives. Um, it basically also provides a, two things. So it provides each of those serv uh, services in there. So when you spin up, let's say I want three uh, Postgres or three web servers, each of them gets their own individual IP on that network, plus there's a load balance IP that it creates for you. And basically, if you, if you speak to the load balance IP from internally, it will randomly distribute it across, across the other servers. But that's also what allows you to bring other services in very quickly. And as soon as they're available, it will does. It basically uses the VIP uh, stuff built into the Linux kernel, which is some of your fastest stuff. The thing I was talking about externally when you speak to port 18 or load balance against your web servers, it's using exactly the same technology. Um, okay, so I was going to basically spin up a Rethink DB, which I loved and they've stopped working on, which makes me very sad. Uh, but it's, it's quite a nice one because you could show inserts and stuff at a quite a, quite a nice rate. Um, uh, to spin it up, once again, this is one thing you don't do in live. Um, I was going to cheat to be, get a high availability cluster. And this has got to do with discoverability. Like, this, just using DNS for discoverability by itself with the default Rethink DB images is not the best way. Eventually, you want to either have a, some script that will query the, the, the DNS entries and then bring them up so they can find each other properly, so you get a proper mesh, or you'll use something like etc. to your console D. Uh, this cheat way is you bring up like a primary that's used, uh, then you basically bring up a whole bunch of secondaries speaking to the primary so they can discover each other via that primary. Um, some other th things here. Uh, oh, sorry, this is just the proxy which would be at the front end. Uh, okay, here I was going to demo that you could hit any of the interfaces on port 8080, hit, hit the proxy. Um, basically, that's just showing you the load balance. Um, okay, then the secondaries. Now, when you bring these things up, you can either, there's different ways of distributing. You can either say, I want one of these, uh, how many replicas of the service you want. 
Um, it will then always try and have that many replicas up. So if you bring, say I want three and you manually kill one with your normal Docker command, it will then spin up another one somewhere else for you. Or let's say that's with the example of the server dying. Uh, the other option is to say global, which is basically I want one of these running on every single thing. So, so what some of the guys are doing, if you've got something tying into the logging of the Docker service, you, you basically run that as global because you want something tying into the log on every single service. Um, I was going to say here, you can also do volume mounts like you did before. Um, they have changed something in this compared to, to if you're just using Docker volume mounts, it won't auto-create directories for you. Um, and apparently they're removing that from the normal Docker as well. If anyone else is doing it, that caused me a lot of pain until I worked out what they'd done. That did work previously. By the way, um, being a Docker captain, we've got early releases. This thing has radically changed three or four times before they released it publicly. All good changes, but all of a sudden you're running commands in your tests and they don't work anymore. Okay, um, basically this was then to bring up the primary. So why this is cheat, this was basically had two servers, two a primary and secondary running on every single server and that was a cheat. Um, obviously you don't need, that's a lot more overhead than you need and that's why you'd rather use some other form. You'd have a startup script that would work out where you want to put the things. Um, okay, so I did do a screenshot of that working. You'll, you'll see these things just start popping up. They discover it works pretty nicely. Um, I'll, I'll try to show anybody who wants to see later that I'm not lying. Um, okay, so this is the DNS and VRP. So for every service that you create, so you'll see I called these things the service RDB primary. You can basically, if you do just a uh, NS lookup on the primary, it will give you that load balance IP. And if you speak to that, it will automatically load balance the communication for you from that. If you just use tasks.rdb primary, it gives you a list of the, in this case, was five IPs. Um, so you can get the individual IPs as you want for that startup script if you want to do it that way. Um, okay, so the demo application that I had was basically just something that's in the background and does inserts into uh, RethinkDB, which is a nice graph so you can see it. Um, in this case, it was going to be replication two, but that's not so much the interesting thing is, let's say later on you want to scale it. That's how you scale it up to four. It's like incredibly easy. You just basically do update, do that. Um, you can also then do rolling updates. Um, and basically what that means is you've now got your new image that you've built. How do you roll it out? Basically you say, once again, update this image. What it will actually do is it'll start updating them. Um, in my testing, I did this once or twice accidentally. If that image is broken, it will stop. So it will replace one or two, two of them. I think the default is two. If those then can't communicate to them anymore, it stops the rollout. So you'll, you'll remember it's all load balancing against, so in this case it was five, it's all load balancing against the other three. You can tune how many must check. You can tune the health test as well, what must be tested. Um, those are all the more advanced things that eventually you'll do, but a lot of it gets done for you out of the box. If then you correct your image and you run that command again, it will replace those two that are dead and then finish because it works. All right, any questions? Sorry about the demo. I, I promise I tested it there this morning. <laughs> Let's see if anything's happening now. There it's up. <laughs> okay, it's gonna take a bit long, I think, to demo it. We're out of time. So anybody wants to see this, I'm happy to show you like now afterwards. Um, but I think it's your open thing now quickly. But if anyone's keen, I can show you quite, quite quickly. All right.